about a decade ago, I joined an organization that was on the verge of really some amazing things. We weren't there yet. We, you know, our employee engagement scores were around the 30th percentile. Our net revenue had been decreasing year over year. We had lost market share and the executive team had been completely replaced by the board of directors. And and all four of us came in within a very short period of time with the assignment to improve the organization. And the first thing we did was look at culture, of course. But by default, as we worked on our culture, we saw everything else improve. Our CMS star rating improved. Our net revenue grew in three years. It grew 69.4%. Here I am 10 years later still quoting that number because it was so (laughs) astonishing. Welcome to Culture Change Rx, the podcast for healthcare professionals that are committed to creating a thriving workplace culture, improving the experiences of employees and patients, and ultimately unlocking their organization's next level of potential. I'm Sue Tetzloff, your host and co-founder of Capstone Leadership Solutions. Join me and my insightful guests each week as we share actionable insights for navigating the crucial people side of the business of healthcare. Subscribe now for weekly dose of Culture Change Rx. Now let's dive into this week's conversation where culture change takes center stage. Welcome to another episode of Culture Change Rx. Again, I have another amazing guest, Matthew Streeter, here with us today. And I'm going to start by just having him introduce himself. Hi, good morning, Sue. My name is Matt Streeter, and I'm the Chief Financial Officer at North Country Healthcare. I have the pleasure of serving in this capacity, and I've been working in healthcare since 2007. I've worked in a number of different organizations from very small rural to the largest nonprofit provider of healthcare services in the country. So I've seen and done quite a bit of things over the course of my career. Prior to healthcare, I worked in banking and investments, and I started my professional career in human resources back in the day. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. Thank you. You know, I'm wondering if I kind of like forgot that fun fact about you starting in human resources, Matt. You know, I just always think of you with your financial hats on, right? And so I'm going to start with a question that I often start with in the podcast, Matt, and that is... Do you kind of have a definition in your mind about what is culture? It just seems like mysterious. So what would you say is kind of your working definition of company culture? That's a great question, Sue. And I I have thought about this a lot over the last, gosh, probably 10, 15, maybe 20 years, but more so in the last 10 years as culture has become not just a buzzword, but a a true asset within our organizations. And the chief financial officer, my role, number one, is to protect the assets of the organization. So in my mind, we've been saying all of our lives that our people are our greatest asset, but no one thinks the financial officer has any role in the people. But that doesn't make any sense to me. So absolutely, I think our people are, are so important. I think every financial officer should be thinking about what we can do to protect our largest asset in our organizations. You used the word odd before, and I would say I am odd. I am an odd CFO in that not only did I start my professional career in HR, but my undergraduate work is in psychology. It wasn't until later that I got my MBA. So my passions have always been people and leadership, and this is just how I get to do that. I love that so much. So what is culture? You know, I've been thinking about this and I kind of have come to the conclusion that a culture is really the amalgamation of all of your people's values, mindsets, priorities, how engaged they are with all of the things I just mentioned, and how aligned we all are as an organization. I think all of that makes up culture and and so much more beyond that. But I think the reason I think that culture is an amalgamation of its people is that we have to be cognizant that as people change, as there's attrition, retirement, people move on and new people come into the organization, we can't ever assume that our culture is is static. It's dynamic. It's always changing. It changes with our people. And we need to be aware of that because if if not, we're going to fail if we think that culture is is a static thing in our organizations. Mm. That is a great definition that 
that collective, you know, nature of all the people coming together that create the culture, which brings up two points. One you made, which is it's always moving, right? But it's also hard to change. So while it's always in flux, it's also hard to intentionally change. So by default, just by the change of people, without putting a lot of intent in hiring who those people are, your culture is going to change. But also when you intentionally want to change it, it's not just like building a building and just having a plan and a builder and just go. It's people. And people don't like to necessarily change, as we know. I know. Right. Of (laughs) course. Yeah, well, it's. I think we we always joke that change is the only certainty anymore, right? Besides, mm-hmm. you know, death and taxes, <laughs> as some people say. But but you're right, and change is very very hard. But change is also hard because we as humans we sometimes make it hard. You know, even if none of the people on your team have turned over, the culture is still changing because people's experiences are always adding and subtracting from the collective group's mentality, if you will. That's why rounding is so important because we have to be continually hearing from our people what is important to them. And we get that through harvesting wins because as they change, what they consider a win will change. That's what's so important about culture work. It's not just checking the box. It's really paying attention to people and thinking about the things you've seen and heard and how they represent what's happening in the organization. It's not just checking a box to say, yep, I rounded on my staff this month. I'm done now till next month. It's really thinking about and reflecting on the things you've gathered to measure all the time. How is the environment changing? How is the culture changing? And are we keeping up with it? Or are we falling behind as our employees, you know, progress and expand and advance within their own roles? You mentioned being in healthcare for a pretty long time and in different organizations and types of organizations. You're probably much like me in this regard. And I bet you patients and family members and employees of all like are like this too, but some of us have our radar on and antennas up and, and really alert and really watching for some of this. But As much as I'm a a measurable kind of person, I love data, I love information, you must too. (laughs) And your roles is we like the data. It's palpable, isn't it? Like you can walk into an organization and you can get a sense of their culture. And I find that in healthcare, I'm more astute maybe there and walking in and observing, you know, whether my mom's a patient there and I'm there with her or I'm a patient or just in my role and other businesses too. It's palpable. The culture is something you sense. And changing that sense over time is to your point about it's the collection (laughs) and it's dynamic because that sense can change over time. Do you find that you're pretty aware of that when you walk into even other business, but definitely healthcare about how does this feel? Absolutely. You said it so well. And you're right. It's not just healthcare. It's every organization, every business. And let me give you an example. I'm sure you've all had this experience where you walk into a business and, you know, it's just a little dingy and there's maybe some clutter on the the counter where you're trying to check out and, and the staff are having a conversation with each other about their weekend. And you immediately kind of get the impression that I'm not maybe as welcome here as a customer as I, I would want to be, or, or maybe these folks don't really enjoy their work that they're doing. And then on the flip side, you have an experience where you walk in and it's clean and fresh and bright and you're immediately welcomed and the staff are engaging and they're providing eye contact and, and inquiring about my experience as opposed to their co-workers weekend, that's a big difference in culture. And that results in a big difference in service and the perception of service from a customer. So when we think about our facilities, what is the experience like for someone walking in? Is the greeter friendly? Is security intimidating? Is it dingy? Is it dark? Or is it bright and welcoming? These are the things we have to think about because that's part of our culture And ultimately, when our staff care, all those little things somehow just get taken care of because everybody wants when they care, they want that experience to be amazing. When no one cares, that's when there's litter on the floor and dust on the tables and all that other stuff, because quite frankly, nobody's concerned about the experience that the customer or the patient in our case is having that day. Yeah. And I just have found myself now to be 
hyper aware and sensitive to that. And I make a lot of decisions about where I spend my money, where I eat, where I shop, those kind of things. And and that's true in healthcare, right? That, you know, like we can be magnets for talent. We can be magnets for patients. We can be the provider and the employer of choice based on some of these things. You know, it's not always about our whistles and bells of what services we offer and the technology. It's all important. I don't want to minimize it, but it's all part of a collective or a package for sure. And like you said, an important asset, <laughs> a very important asset. Can you think of an example in your career? I know you likely can. I think, you know, it's hard to get through our careers this far without being able to think of an example of where you've been in a situation where you've really noticed a deliberate before and after. It wasn't just by happenstance or fate that the culture got better or worse, but that there was some real intent and designed actions that led to culture improving. Absolutely. So I've had the pleasure of working on culture in four different organizations now in various stages, you know, twice now at the very beginning of the journey, if you will. In fact, I still today, it's just ingrained in my head now that this is, it doesn't matter what organization or what you want to call it, it will always be the journey to excellence in my head, which I define two ways. It's the journey to become the employer of choice and the journey to become the provider of choice in healthcare. Mm -hmm. So when people ask me, what is the journey to excellence? That's what I tell them. It's Mm -hmm. really to become the provider and the employer of choice. I've done it in various degrees four times now in my career. And I will tell you, the more deliberate, the more planned, and the more standardized you can be in your approach, the easier it is for a couple of reasons. Number one, everybody knows where we're going and how we're going to get there. That's super, super important. If it's too ambiguous and no one really gets it, It's just going to be spinning wheels and very little in terms of of measurable outcome. The other reason I like it is exactly that. You can measure your outcomes. If you have a clear plan and you know exactly what it is, the needle you're trying to move, then you'll know if you moved that needle or not. Whereas if you go into it sort of willy-nilly or you don't have a regimented plan or process, then you can't possibly expect to have clear results either. Mm, Yeah. That comes up something that I hear in, in my line of work where I serve as a strategist, trainer, and coach to organizations that want to go on these journeys to excellence, become the employer of choice and provider of choice. And there is cultural work to make that happen. It's it's not just process work. It's not just service line work and, and those kind of things. You know, one of the things I, I'll hear sometimes is that, one, Yes, there's a pathway, but we don't want it to be cookie cutter. And two is kind of behind the scenes. I'll hear people say, even if there's a proven pathway, I'm not sure it's possible for us. I'm not sure it'll work for us. I mean, did you ever in the four journeys that you mentioned experience that kickback of, yeah, there's a mapped out way, but it worked for somebody else. I'm not sure it'll work for us kind of sense. Absolutely. If I had a dollar for every time somebody pushed back on the on the evidence based leadership framework, I'd probably have six seven hundred dollars by now. Who knows? I, I don't know, but <laughs> but you get the point. It's change, of course. Nobody likes that. But the other thing too, let's just say fifty percent of the population really don't want to be told what to do. I'm one of those people. I don't do well being told what to do. I like to be a little more creative, a little more autonomous. And I started my very first journey as a naysayer. I thought this was all crud. You know, like this was just one more thing I didn't have time for as a young leader in healthcare. And I was exactly the person you just described. I was like, okay, I'm going to check the box so that they think I did this, but I'm going to do it my way. And of course, it doesn't work. I'm generally a very compliant person. I mean, you kind of have to be if you're going to be the CFO of a health system. And I, you know, of course, don't like to have criticism in my performance evaluation. So I decided I was I was going to do this, even if I didn't believe in it and I didn't want to. And unfortunately or unfortunately, fortunate for me and the organization, unfortunate for my ego, it worked. When you follow the framework... It works. And I found my name and departments in the top decile of our very large organization at the time in terms of our our performance from an employee engagement perspective. 
And then I suddenly realized, whoa, what happens if I start putting some actual effort into this thing? And that's when it took off. So to your question about standardization, absolutely, there are barriers and people are going to say, oh, we don't have to do it this way. We can customize. We can, everybody can do it their own way. The reality of it is you're not going to see the same results and it makes measurement much harder. And really, I would encourage anybody who's, you know, hesitating, just do it. Just try it. Just start. Do something and get going on it and you will be amazed. And then if you, you know, even if you have to keep tweaking it to get closer to the standard, that's okay. But don't hesitate because you're afraid to try it. You know, that answer that makes me think about the fact that sometimes, and whether it's initiatives like this or other ones that are strategically important to our organization's future and success, is that we get in our mind that we have to have consensus and buy-in and agreement before we start versus committing to starting because it's the right thing to do. It's, it's strategically a priority to do it. And then gaining that momentum, support, consensus, buy-in, like the example you shared. You didn't say, yes, let's do this, and then jump right on board and say, I'm going to be an early adopter. You did it for your own reasons, but it was only when you started experiencing the positive benefit and proof that now you say, wow, yeah, this is the right thing. And, And sometimes we have a mantra, just start. Which is, you know, for that reason is in my own experience, we took three years to decide whether or not to just start. And in those three years, our community and its members didn't have great access to great health care. Shame on us, right? Because we were not willing or brave to just start even without buy-in and consensus or maybe even a perfect roadmap yet. Yeah, that's sort of where we're at in my organization today. And what I would say to that is healthcare is not a democracy. We don't, we don't vote. Leadership does not work if that's how, you know, we're going to do things. Consensus is another, you know, we will never get consensus. So if that's what you're waiting for, you know, you're going to be waiting a long, long time Mm because it'll never come. There are times as leaders that we just have to know what the right decision is, make that decision. And then sometimes I hate to use the word force, but sometimes we have to compel others to get on the journey with us. It doesn't take long though, usually in my experience, for people to to see the value. So they forgive you pretty quickly after the fact for forcing them to get on the bus. Mm -hmm. I feel like sometimes as a leader, but also now as a strategist, trainer, and coach working in partnership with organizations that are bravely and boldly going on this journey is that sometimes I feel like they're borrowing our confidence in them. They're borrowing our knowledge of what's on the other side of this, that we can see it and they can't yet. And that we're just kind of like lending that to them until they can see it themselves, I guess. And it's kind of a fun perspective because we can see the, you know, the light at the end of the tunnel. They've never seen the light before, you know, possibly, and they've never taken that journey there. Yeah. Sometimes that's one of our major roles is just lending them that confidence, even when they're not sure they, they really know what's going to happen next. (laughs) I, you know, that's, that's a good point, Sue. And and I'll tell you that now that I'm on my, you know, fourth try at this, it sort of lends some new credibility to me as a leader to be able to say, guys, I've done this before. Let me tell you how it works. Here's what you can expect. And it's true. And it is exactly that, Sue. And and so for anybody who's doing this for the very first time, it's maybe a little bit scarier and tougher. Each time it gets easier. And if you think, oh, I'm only going to do this once, probably not. Most of us are going to do this multiple times in our career, even if it's at the same organization. Yes, that's a good point. Some of the organizations that we've been working with now in our work through Capstone, they're kind of on a V2 or a 2.0 version. It's like in strategic planning where that we say there's an S curve and you might have a strategy defined for three years and it might look pretty similar in two or three strategic planning cycles, six years, nine years, where the core strategies are pretty solid and, and kind of similar and you're not really having a huge change up. And that could happen in your cultural journeys too, is that 
the plan really looks similar for a long period of time until you're kind of getting to that point where you go, wow, there's something distinctly different. I remember that happening in my organization when we created a new strategy around high reliability. So when we were really, really poor in safety and quality and in our culture around that, we couldn't have a vision for high reliability and zero defect. Like that was just like, if we thought even average quality scores was was a big stretch. But once we got there and we're like, okay, now we have to go for high reliability, we realized we had to change our culture to do that. It, you know, like our culture needed a, a new iteration, uh, an up level in the strategy to go from good to great and then great to even greater. So to your point is, it's just not a constant maintenance and do over once you've been on this journey for a while. There's going to be these moments. You're right. And you alluded to this, but as you embark on the journey and you start to see results, your goals change, your targets change. And and you kind of said this, but in the beginning, your goal might be to get into the top half. And then two years down the road, you're realizing that what you thought was impossible, maybe the 75th percentile, top quartile, isn't impossible. And then all of a sudden, you're starting to shoot for top decile. And, you know, in the beginning, you would would have never thought that to be possible and would never have written a goal to be top decile. And that's why the journey is often version two, version three, because you realize, and as does everybody else on your team, we can do a lot better than we thought we could. And now we have the tools to do that. So let's raise the bar. Let's see how far we can push this and redefine excellence to whatever excellence 2.0 is going to mean for the organization. It might have been 75th percentile and now it's 90th or it might have been, you know, whatever net revenue or percentage of of margin and now it's x because you've you've matured as an organization. You've evolved. Yeah. I realized that especially with the new generation of workforce, I've heard these comments is they love it when organizations keep track. They love it when they set measurable goals. Like that's aspiring. That's exciting. I think that compels us that when we're on these cultural and behavior change and, you know, elevating high standards and things of that, that kind of seem soft and unmeasurable and whatever, is that we really have to connect them to things like growth goals or patient experience goals or market share increases or things like that so that they see that it's the action plan that's part of hitting those numbers that this stuff that seems soft really has a hard number impact and they can watch that number change as the culture and the behavior changes. Absolutely. And that's that's exactly the importance, at least in my mind, of the pillar boards or communication boards, depending on which you know, which version you use or what you call it, but having those measures and being transparent with them, that's the whole why behind it, because it becomes positive reinforcement to the journey. It's another thing you can celebrate. And quite frankly, the reason I like the pillars is because it's not only about money or about patient experience. It's also about things like average wage for staff Mm -hmm. or percentage of participation in the retirement plans, because those are indicators of engagement and great place to work as well. And that's why looking at things from all five or six of the pillars, depending on which version you like, it really breaks it down to more than just the things we would think of immediately as goals, like patient satisfaction scores, you know, quality outcomes, your CMS star rating. There's way more that a culture can measure or that we can measure when we're talking about culture that then become positive reinforcement and drivers to keep that momentum building and building until everyone in the organization is so excited about the journey that that becomes the new culture. And what a reward that is for everybody involved. Yeah, I I think data savvy cultures are really amazing. It's an important aspect of the culture is that we use data to understand what to work on and if what we're working on is working and that that employees learn to understand that as much as any leader would. And I find it exciting when I watch those light bulbs go on in employee-driven teams where now they're really owning that employee data from the annual survey or however frequency they do, or they're the ones owning the patient voice and the survey data 
in that regard. And even things like really understanding finance. I remember, you know, the first time a plumber came up to me and we had a goal to increase days cash on hand and he could speak to that. And he was like, he knew what it meant and, and whatever. Right. I'm like, yeah, this is so cool to have such a daddy sap data savvy culture. And that that really is something that we can teach and encourage. And, you know, I've been a part of a leadership team where, you know, we hit a lot of data from employees, not intentionally, I don't think, <laughs> but we just felt like it, it wasn't theirs to know, or they didn't care, or they couldn't care. And what would they right. do with it? <laughs> or we as leaders, we discount, they won't understand it, or it's not relevant to their position. But the reality of it is when an employee cares about the organization, it is relevant to them. And it is something that they want to see. And if nothing else, as leaders, we can demonstrate why it's important. And that having data as opposed to assumptions or anecdotes is substantially better and, and something that we can hopefully get them to be involved in. And, and you talked about, I forgot how you said it exactly, but immediately in my head, I pictured starting department meetings in front of the pillar board so mm -hmm. that the leader can, can explain to everybody on the team why the things on that board are there and what they mean for the success of the organization. I've watched that happen. And then I've watched to the point where the staff start to ask questions and they start to hold the leader accountable to say, hey, by the way, you didn't round on us last month. What's going on? And that's great. I mean, some leaders are a little squirrely about that, but mm -hmm. the reality of it is a good leader wants that feedback and accountability from their team because it's a demonstration that they care about you as a leader. They want you to be successful too. It's all part of building a better culture. Yes. You bring up such a great point about that it's over time and that consistency that it's not the first time you round. It's not the first time you stand in front of that pillar board and explain it that that everybody gets it. Like it's just that's just not going to happen. But it's through that routine, consistent practice of some of these things that we know can make these kind of changes in organizations that it becomes, this is how we do it around here, right? <laughs> right? We set goals, we measure things, we transparently report them, we have high standards, we build relationships surrounding it. It just becomes, it's not extra work, it's how we do our work. <laughs> but it's not that first time that you get that reinforcing hit that this is going to make this big of a difference. Right. It's like the first time you get on the treadmill story of my life, but every five years, there's a new initiative to uh, get healthier, lose some weight. Right. I mean, I'm, I'm a Midwesterner by, by birth, so this is an eternal struggle for me, but you don't get on the treadmill the first time and then get off and go, wow, that was amazing. My whole life is better now. No, it's awful. In fact, it takes more work to go back the next day than it did the first day. And sometimes you have to just keep doing that and, and pushing through that burn, if you will, until you start to see the results and they will come. And once you see the results, that's when I feel like the momentum starts to build. And that's where you have to celebrate it too. Like, don't take that for granted. When you see the needle move, even if it's tiny, celebrate it. Pizza parties, streamers, whatever you need to do. It's so important to acknowledge that and then uh, to keep that going because you're right. It is so hard in the beginning. That positive reinforcement and celebration you know, we've had this discussion, you know, offline of this podcast before in our history of knowing each other is I've always been fascinated how challenging it is for organizations to turn on that part of their culture in which they celebrate. Yeah. It, it's one of those things that it seems like it should be an easy thing to incorporate into this is what we do. When we win, we celebrate the win. Even, you know, when we have, it's like my son and when he plays hockey, you know, I don't wait till the game's over and then I clap, you know, it's like every great hit, every great save, every great, right. you know, goal, you're, you're going to celebrate all along the way. And in our journeys, we need to celebrate, you know, there's really no finish line, right? There's no end to the game. So <laughs> no, because the game, the game keeps changing as we play it. So we always have to, you know, adjust how we play the game. 
you know, going back to what we first started in the very beginning, your culture is always changing. So if you want to have a good culture, you have to keep up with with those changes. So that's an important part of this. Absolutely. Well, you know what I was thinking when I was preparing for our time together today, I was thinking maybe you'll anticipate a question like this, and I can't not ask. I'm sure our audience is saying, hey, Sue, you got a CFO there, (laughs) and you need to ask them, what's the return on investment? What's the ROI on investing in culture change and and enhancement? Like, Where does the rubber meet the road on ROI? It's a great question. It's a question I've been asked multiple times as a CFO who is a proponent of this work, because it is a little bit tough sometimes to measure the outcomes. I would, again, I'm going to go back to PI boards and your strategic plan and the rest of those measurements should be developed with culture in mind, because what you'll find is as your culture improves, so will pretty much all of the measures that you're watching as well. And I can give you a couple of specific examples. About a decade ago, I joined an organization that was on the verge of really some amazing things. We weren't there yet. We, you know, Our employee engagement scores were around the 30th percentile. Our net revenue had been decreasing year over year. We had lost market share. And the executive team had been completely replaced by the board of directors. And, and all four of us came in within a very short period of time with the assignment to improve the organization. And the first thing we did was look at culture, of course. But by default, as we worked on our culture, we saw everything else improve. Our CMS star rating improved. Our net revenue grew in three years. It grew 69.4%. Here I am 10 years later, still quoting that number because it was so (laughs) astonishing that you could move the needle on culture and improve your financial performance at the same time Those are the sort of return on investment that you can't necessarily plan for in advance, but you will reap the benefit of as your journey progresses. Mm -hmm. On the contrary, I've been part of an organization where the culture and the journey started to fall apart. And quite frankly, it was because as an executive leadership team, we failed to recognize that the culture is dynamic. And so we felt that what we had always done is what we should continue to do because it served us so well in the past. And unfortunately, that hospital is in serious financial trouble. The entire leadership team is now gone. And that's an example of the return on the lack of investment. If you don't invest in your culture, that's what you can expect to have happen. Yeah, you know, it, it just goes right in line with the analogy you gave about your health, right? If you know the plan that works for you is to do X, Y, and Z, and you keep doing it, but at a certain point you hit a plateau, and then at that time you decide, okay, so I'm going to stop getting on the treadmill, I'm gonna st- but you don't replace it with anything else. You don't, you know, try to see what else it might be, then yeah, you're, you're going to slip backwards in your results and, and how you feel. So both subjectively how you feel, but also measurably some of those metrics and Organizations are just like that. Yeah. I find that you know organizations are very much like humans, <laughs> like a, a human and all those body systems, right? <laughs> Work into yes, yeah. So, uh, this has been such a delightful conversation. I anticipated it would be, and it it did not uh, disappoint. I do want to leave our guests with you know one final question to you that just to make sure it's kind of one of those questions we use in rounding, you know, is there anything else you want us to know or that you want to ask, but you know, is there a key message lesson or tactic that you haven't brought out in this discussion already? You've brought out so many things, but is there a special message lesson or tactic that you'd want to make sure got included in this episode for our audience to benefit from? I probably could spend three more hours, right? Talking talking about culture and the things I want people to know. You know, I think first thing is don't be afraid of your CFO. I think CFOs maybe got a bad rap in the 80s and 90s, but there's a whole new generation of us that are not just accountants who who actually have personalities and, and thoughts and can quite frankly be a major contributor to your cultural journey don't discount your your finance officer. That's my one plug for my peers out there. I, I love that. And I have to say, I'm seeing a change in that. Like when we're getting approached by organizations that are looking for help in this way, it's interesting how many times recently it's actually been the CFO that's reached out to us. 
not, you know, patient experience officer, or HR officer, or the CEO, it's actually been CFO. <laughs> well, and that follows, if we continue to say that our people are our greatest asset, then every CFO listening, if you haven't picked up the torch, it is time. You mm-hmm. owe it to your organization to take this seriously. And as we talked about the return on investment, quite frankly, I don't know where else you're going to get the kind of return that you will on your culture. Mm. That is a magic final message there, Matthew. That is just great. And, you know, I could say the same thing, but it wouldn't, it wouldn't land as well coming from me as it would be from you, given your background, experience, and credibility in your part of the industry that's specific to, to that as well. So thank you so much for being here. Culture Change RX. This is a fun platform for us to be able to bring guests like you forward to people who are interested in this kind of work. And maybe they're just thinking about starting it. Maybe they've started it. Maybe they're well into it. Maybe they're ready for that next iteration that you spoke about. But if they're listening, they probably at least are interested and maybe very involved in this work. And I know you've added value to them. Thank you, Matthew. Uh, it's been an absolute pleasure, Sue, catching up with you. And uh, to all of all of you listening, best wishes on your journey. And uh, as Sue said before, just start. Stop overthinking it and just start. Just start. Great words. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, Sue. Thanks for tuning in to Culture Change Rx. If you found value in today's episode and you are a believer in fostering change in healthcare, join us in making a difference. Follow, rate, and review our podcast on your favorite platform. Share it with colleagues and your network. Together, we can make a lasting impact. Until next week, keep inspiring positive change.